thank two uh, years because um, they gave me this opportunity um, to to research in in an international um, organization, and I'm very happy to have uh, to have this opportunity. Um, so I hope you you see my screen. I think I I need to. Um, I hope you see my presentation, right? <clears throat> well, um, this uh, presentation, because I need to, to configure the screen. Okay, thank you very much, sorry. Uh, so I start. Um, this presentation aims to review some of the most important contemporary debates on humanitarian organizations in which experts from different fields uh, such as international relations, anthropology or philosophy have taken part. I would like to draw attention particularly to those criticisms in which the considerations of philosophers such as Michel Foucault or Giorgio Agamben have become especially relevant. This brief talk is only a very short part of a larger research on philosophy of poverty. After having studied thoroughly the criticisms that denounce uh, the fact that the development paradigm has done uh, more harm than good uh, to the global poor, I wondered if these criticisms were also applicable to humanitarian assistance whose demand for an urgent response would justify the absence of a deep reflection before action. In fact, many critics initially, or many criticisms initially addressed to development by advocates of a post-development era have been also extended to humanitarian aid system. Even if we assume the suitability of this criticism, do, we imp do they imply, sorry, that we should give up the universal duty of assistance uh, to avoid its perverse consequences? I do not think so. Therefore, it is crucial to carefully assess the main assumptions about human needs and therefore about human nature, hidden in humanitarianism and the character of its intimate connection with the current international order. This will set us in a position to better perform our uh, duty of assistance, I think. Uh, the presentation tries to address the following issues. As a preliminary step, I will clarify some concepts that are not always clearly distinguished and whose confusion also reveals the links existing among the different uh, sorts of aid. Secondly, we will critically assess the principles of humanitarianism as they were specified by the Red Cross International Committee. Thirdly, we will tackle the criticisms made to the international aid systems it's aid system, sorry, inspired by the concept of bare life created by Giorgio Agamben, and also those that relate uh, to the new forms of global governance. I am talking here about system, about humanitarian aid system, because um, um, the criticism address the whole organizational conglomerate and the discourse concerning humanitarian aid and not the work conducted by specific NGOs or volunteers. Finally, I will list some of the ethical principles that in my opinion could serve as moral criteria to evaluate the kind of aid that we are providing and to redesign new aid programs. Before proceeding to develop the core of this uh, presentation, I would like to clarify some concepts that are often confused uh, by the general public and even by, by some experts. Primarily, uh, we must distinguish three different sectors of aid, 
development aid, humanitarian aid, and human rights-based aid. According to the authors Redfield and Bornstein, these three aid sectors, sectors sorry, uh, imply different and even conflicting claims, alliances, and temporal assumptions regarding resolutions. Development aid pursues economic and most recently social improvements too. Human well-being is mainly understood as livelihood. Uh, and it involves a long-term planning since the problems it faces are structural or uh, systemic. In the words of uh, Redfield and Bornstein, development frames human good through an, uh, an imagined future. Although the roots of this paradigm are to be found in the period of European colonialism, the discourse of U.S. President Harry Truman in 1949 is commonly marked as the beginning of the international hegemony of development discourse. The criticisms to this unilinear model were intensified during the 1980s, which in, which in a way forced to redefine the concept of development as uh, sustainable development, participative development, human development, etc. Regarding the second um, aid sector, human rights organizations advocate permanently civil and political rights against states all over the, all over the world. More inclusively, they also combat social and economic injustice. The history of human rights organizations is linked to the founding of United States, United Nations, sorry, in 1945 after the Second World War and the Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. From this perspective, justice defines well-being. Finally, the characteristics of humanitarian aid are also a specific and different both from development aid and from human rights-based aid. Unlike development aid, humanitarian aid is usually associated to urgent action as a response to emergencies issued mostly for, from war, other forms of organized violence or natural disasters. It seeks to provide short-term relief to the population and to save lives that are in danger. Humanitarian aid history is quite older, going back to the 19th century origins of the Red Cross and sometimes usually linked to Victorian uh, charity institutions. Having distinguished these three aid sectors, it is still important to notice that there are some facts that explain the, confus the confusion existing between them, starting with their common organizational structure. They all rely on institutions such as international, national, and local NGOs, nonprofit organizations, intergovernmental organizations such as those of UN or um, charitable and philanthropic uh, foundations. There are also local NGOs, but usually um, local or grassroots organizations are not legally registered as NGOs, even when they are non-profit organizations and share NGOs, humanitarian and development goals. Philanthropic foundations are devoted to rates to raised funds um, and financing big projects. In most of the cases related to medical and research, uh, to medical research, sorry, and treatment, which all at once concern humanitarian and development goals. In fact, it is very common that aid organizations devote to both humanitarian and development aid in addition to advocating human rights. For instance, Oxfam Care and Catholic Relief Services first created um, to provide relief in Europe during the Second World War uh, 
turn after the post-war period into poverty alleviation and development organizations. The UN Refugee Agency acts uh, simultaneously as humanitarian organization uh, during migration crisis and um, con uh, continuously acts uh, to in defense of uh, the human rights. Furthermore, as um, the authors Barnett, Barnett and Weiss argued, many state or entrepreneurial activities could conceivably be deemed humanitarian. What is then which, identify, which identifies or defines humanitarian organizations as different from political or entrepreneurial organizations? A possible answer points out to the core principles of humanitarianism as adopted by the Red Cross in its 20th International Conference in 1965. Um, the principle of humanity, that is, alleviate human suffering, protect life and health, ensure respect for the human being. Impartiality consists in the principle of impartiality consists in um, that th there must be no discrimination in assistance. The priorities, the priorities will solely define according to urgency. The principle of neutrality establishes not taking sides in hostilities or engage at any time in controversies of a political, racial, religious, or ideological nature. The principle of independence <clears throat> um, established auto, um, autonomy from political governments. And um, the principle of voluntary service uh, established that there is no desire of gain in humanitarian actions. The last two principles that are not here um, are unity and universality. They are less important. I, I didn't put it uh, in the PowerPoint because they are organizational principles of the Red Cross, which um, is defined as a worldwide institution, this concern its universality, and which embraces, embraces sorry, with, um, all national Red Cross uh, societies, um, which um, concerns its its unity because there can be only one Red Cross national um, society in its country. Leaving aside these two last principles, unity and universality, refer then to a Red Cross organization, we could agree that the rest of the principles suit uh, what we usually understand as humanitarian action. However, if we analyze these principles carefully, we find, we find that either they are um, today quite far away from the actual functioning of a humanitarian system, or they are simply no more desirable. I, I insist that I address here the whole international aid system and not the work of a specific NGOs or volunteers. Starting from the bottom, voluntary service is no more the rule in the international aid system. Aid sectors uh, have been increasingly professionalized in the, last ten, uh, in the last years. And even when we can suppose that money is not the primary motivation of aid workers, they are no more volunteers uh, and probably they have other motivations such as the will of being acknowledged, etc. Independence. Um, although politically independent, NGOs can get funding from state or local governments. Some NGOs are mostly funded by governmental institutions, while others explicitly re reject to be financed by official development assistance, for example. Nevertheless, apart from well publicized disasters were uh, advertised disasters, humanitarian organizations experience uh, very difficulties to get enough funds uh, 
from private donors. So they usually must increasingly rely uh, on official fund funding, which uh, in a way puts them down um, or which in a way puts them under the rule of uh, governments or governmental interests. Neutrality. Neutrality has been proved to be neither possible nor always ethically correct. Traditionally, there was a tendency to set apart humanitarian aid from politics. Humanitarian workers define their activity as a political, non-political activity. This attitude was already condemned during the 90s when during the Rwandan, Rwandan genocide, the refugee camps supported by international aid system were in fact being controlled by soldiers of the genocidal regime. As African rights uh, organization denouncing, denounced in 1994. NGOs were accused of feeding the victims of the genocide alongside with its executors which was a big scandal. Um, impartiality, what about impartiality? Concerning the principle of being impartial, we shall question who defines, in fact, which issues must be prioritized. As an example, 58% uh, of the funds received by the UN were allocated to Sudan see Iraq, Yemen, and especially Syria in um, two, uh, 215. Hence, as uh, some experts argue, the priorities of humanitarian action are subordinated to the securitizing strategy of the war against terrorism. Other authors insist in the fact that the authority of humanitarian organizations give them the chance or the power to prescribe which actions should be undertaken and to produce, to produce um, an epistemological and operational framework of um, humanitarian action, which actions must be undertaken. In relation to the idea to give priority uh, to the most urgent cases of distress that comes with the idea of impartiality. Um, there is another example that occurred during the, um, during the 1998 famine, famine in Sudan, when um, NGOs were targeting assistance only to those that were, manif only to those um, children mostly, or those people that were manifesting signs of advanced malnutrition, um, and um, they encountered the opposition of the local people that believed that the food had to be distributed equally. Um, Médecins Saint Frontier accused local people of depriving their uh, starving ch children of the food, but in fact, as Simon Harrigan has argued, famine was faced by larger numbers of population than, uh, than eight agencies were uh, in fact targeting. Um, the last principle or the first principle is humanity. And humanity is already linked with the criticism of the philosopher Giorgio Agamben that Inomo Sacker deals with this question in a scarce but in um, in a, a, a scarce a scarce paragraph that has nevertheless been further developed in international relations literature. Following Hannah Arendt, Agamben understands that the separation of the rights of man from the rights of citizen leaves the rights of man without content in the, or without power in the moment that they can no more be um, understood as the rights of the citizens of a nation state. The police, the city, and in its etymological meaning, uh, politics um, in the West are based, according to Agamben, in the isolation of the bare life as different from the ordinary living of those recognized with the citizen status. This is the paragraph uh, from Giorgio Agamben. Uh, 
uh, which I am commenting. Um, the idea of a company is that uh, humanitarian organizations maintain a secret solidarity with the powers that uh, they ought to fight. Why? Because in a way they accept to take care and therefore they help in the control of those neglected by state sovereign, sovereignty, implicitly assuming that the division between political life um, that implicitly assuming, sorry, the division between political life and bear life. Impl um, implicitly assuming that there are lives that are to be managed not by political systems or states or nation states, but by a humanitarian aid system. I remember something that happened in Spain two or three years ago when workers of the Spanish Maritime Safety Agency, a public entity in charge of maritime security in Spain, denounced uh, in Spanish waters, denounced that they were receiving orders, political orders to avoid boats where migrants were trying to reach the coast. Um, these boats usually need to be rescued because um, of, the past, of, the, of the bad conditions of the boat. And the, the, the orders that um, safety agency uh, workers were receiving was to avoid the, the boats in order not to have to rescue them. The idea to bear in mind is that powerful nation states usually decide which populations deserve which kind of aid and use international aid organizations as a substitute of politics uh, and as a way to release their responsibility. Agamben also uh, draws uh, um, a distinction between the state which is governed by the law and the state of exception established by the law, but creating a space where everything is allowed. He, he uses the, um, the example of the, um, of the camps, of the Nazi camps, but uh, he applies this to, um, to, to actual or to contemporary world, saying that um, there are more um, and more uh, exceptional spaces uh, that are left aside um, politics. And for example, um, the example that he gives are the, the problem with um, refugees or irregular um, migration, but we could also think of uh, civil wars, failed states, etc. Um, and in fact, the, the thing is uh, that humanitarian uh, law, international humanitarian law is defined as a legal framework for exceptional circumstances. Circumstances that are becoming, as I said, increasingly common in the contemporary world. Another conclusion, uh, conclusion that we can draw from Agamben's criticism is that the traditional humanitarian understanding of well-being in terms of body health or mere survival can neglect other important aspects of human life, such as identity, agency, politics, etc. This is what happened to in the example of Sudan famine, uh, when the people's uh, course of action was disregarded and even condemned by professional aid workers that instead of listening to the, to the population, were accusing them of being responsible of the starvation of their, of their children. Um, the classical principles of traditional humanitarianism started then to be challenged since the beginning of the globalization uh, and the boundaries defining humanitarian aid system or humanitarian or humanitarianism started to blur, started to, um, to disappear. As I have already mentioned, some organizations um, tackled post-conflict and development activities. Um, some humanitarian organizations well understood 
so um, started to do um, other kind of um, actions as uh, linked to development to post-conflict reconstruction etc although um, there are still some resistances uh, within humanitarian world to these uh, changes um, because some people want to maintain the core principles of uh, humanitarianism as we have seen it um, uh, first. Humanitarian organizations uh, are most and most conscious that their actions have always political consequences and have become persuaded that it is necessary to take charge of the social conditions that are deeply causing suffering. In other words, it is necessary to go beyond the symptom, diagnose and treat the problem, and therefore it will be necessary to go through politics. Furthermore, humanitarian community is increasingly persuaded that humanitarian action does not end with the termination of the emergency. Just because lives are no longer at immediate risk, uh, it does not mean that suffering has ended. This new trend in humanitarianism arises as an answer to the increasingly complex nature of states of emergency. However, this brings closer humanitarian and development aid, which makes the first more vulnerable to the criticism that have uh, been made to the second. Um, we have uh, already mentioned um, a first criticism that uh, they share, the neglection of grassroots populations criteria by the, by the experts. Another criticism is related to the role that humanitarian and development organizations have secretly or secretly play in global governance. In the words of Barnett and Weiss, humanitarian organizations are part of a broader set of globalizing forces that are involved in controlling and remaking the world. Increasingly, aid agencies are thus part of a broader project of governance. The general idea assumed by humanitarian organizations is that international community inherits the responsibility of failed states to protect their populations, but it's never questioned why uh, some states fail to do so. At least in official discourse, the new, the new conflicts and wars seem to have um, always inner or domestic origins, corruption, etc., and usually conceal the interest of powerful, powerful states in those territories or the influence of external agency in those conflicts. Um, I think I don't have uh, too much time for explaining, bon, for giving some examples of this. So I um, go um, directly to the conclusions. Um, so the my idea or at the end the what i try to do is to offer uh, some new principles that uh, could serve as moral criteria to um, assess to evaluate our uh, or international humanitarian aid system uh, humanitarian organizations and humanitarian programs and finally could serve as two as citizens to decide which kind of organizations we want to collaborate with. Um, the first idea is that um, uh, I take it from Thomas Pogge, a philosoph the philosopher Thomas Pogge, that indicated how negative duties and uh, duties related with, um, with um, or the duty to avoid doing harm should be primary when we consider global justice issues and justice issues in general. According to this idea, the first duty of Western citizens should be undertaking civil and political actions in order to avoid the damages, the damages that their governments can cause 
or um, half cost to other countries uh, with less uh, powerful states or with less power. This leads us to the duty of the citizen to perform our always informed actions and not just answering emotionally to NGOs advertising showing human suffering. This links the idea of justice with recognition too. A recognition of the others as human beings uh, with full lives, um, with autonomy, with identity, with their own culture, and not just treating them as bare life uh, in terms of agamben. Um, that bare life that must be safe, but after that, we can send those lives back to their countries without even considering their demands for asylum, for example. Or we can be outraged uh, if we learn or if we um, are informed that migrants are dying near of our coasts, but not wondering what kind of bilateral, bilateral agreements um, have um, our countries established with third countries as Morocco or Mauritania to externalize um, European borders and creating their worst detention centers for migrants. Um, we, we could find many examples of this um, related with migration, but also with civil wars in distant places, with so-called civil wars in distant places. Recognition implies cultural awareness too. Humanitarian organizations cannot, uh, cannot act disregarding populations, beliefs, or wills as we have seen in the example of Sudan famine. This means also insisting in the idea that humanitarian aid must be demand-based. Western organizations, aid technicians cannot act as if they already knew the needs of the populations that sometimes are treated as if they were less rational or less capable to judge what are the best solutions uh, because they don't have um, scientific knowledge or statistical knowledge. Last but not, le but not least, we must assure that uh, the aid is never conditioned, is never given um, expecting to get something back. And that's all. Thank you very much.